Hey guys, it's me, Carrie, and yeah, I look crazy again, and the light and everything is bad, but I just wanted to finish up Homecoming for you guys, so please disregard this shitty light and setup. But anyway, I hope I can read this all. We will try. All right. The four of them stood in the hallway, Graham and Dicey, Preston, Dr. Epstein. Nobody knew what to say. I'm sorry, Dr. Epstein said at last. His hands moved nervously, and Dicey bet he would have liked to light one of his little cigars. His eyes flickered away from theirs. It's for the best. Some of our cases linger on for years. Graham cut him off. I appreciate all you've done, she said briskly. And you as well, she said to Preston. Now about the arrangements, Dr. Epstein began. We'd like to take her back with us, Graham said. A frown crossed his face. But I understood that she lived in Massachusetts. I understood when she was first identified. His voice tapered off, then ceased. Ordinarily, Mrs. Tillerman, the charity cases are given over to medical research one. Dicey felt the heat of Graham's anger and saw out of the corner of her eye Graham's chin lift. Yes, Graham asked. The doctor did not like this conversation. The expense, he said, the undertaker shipping the coffin down to Maryland, isn't it? I don't think you can pay for it, unless, of course, our records are mistaken. <clears throat> How much would it be, Graham asked. I don't think it could cost you less than $700, Dr. Epstein answered. His mouth pursed as if he didn't like to talk about money. Dicey's heart fell. $700. They would never have that much money, not for something that wasn't necessary. Then she noticed something. Her heart was back in one piece. How had that happened? It wasn't that she didn't feel sad. She felt sad enough, and sad in a way she'd never felt before, because now Mama was really gone for always. Dicey must have let go and never known it. Sorry, guys. Just gotta dab my nose. Unless she were cremated, Preston said. She spoke to the doctor as if she was suggesting that to him. He shrugged. If you were to have her cremated and carried her with you, Preston said to Graham in her gentle voice. Not to mention burial expenses, Dr. Epstein remarked. <clears throat> in Maryland, a cremated body can be buried wherever you want, Graham announced. Thank you, she said to Preston. I wonder if you can recommend an undertaker. You'll see to all this, Dr. Epstein asked the nurse. She nodded, not speaking. He shook hands with Graham. He nodded to Dicey and strode importantly off down the hall. Preston gave them the name of an undertaker. She didn't say anything sympathetic, didn't apologize, didn't try to make them feel better. She just helped as much as she could, telling them how to find the undertakers, telling them how the, uh, that the undertaker would come to pick up Mama, and thanking them for coming to be with Mama. When they stepped out onto the sidewalk, Graham halted. She opened her purse, took out her new gloves, and put them on her hands. She breathed in deeply. The air stinks, she remarked. They set off together. When they stepped out, oh, sorry, the undertaker who wore a dark suit and a solemn expression received them in his office. He sat behind his desk and filled out forms while Graham gave him information. I should tell you, he said, that Miss Preston called. She thought you would want to expedite the cremation. I've already dispatched a vehicle to pick up the deceased. That's right, Graham said. Dicey tried to think of Mama as the deceased and not as Mama. Graham reached out to take her hand and held on to it. Dicey held on back. What will the charge be, Graham asked. There's a minimum charge of $350, then the urn, of course. Dicey looked up, surprised. In which to place the ashes, he explained to her. We have a good selection. If you will choose the one you want, you can return to pick her up at... He looked at his wristwatch and consulted a paper on his desk. Three o'clock. <clears throat> when they studied the urns, Dicey couldn't see any she wanted, not for Mama. Some were tall china ones with dark flowers on them. Some were cold metals, silver and brass. Some were plain white china and looked like vases. Dacey didn't say anything, however. It wasn't as if she could pay for any one of them. She stood back and waited. No, Graham muttered to herself. No, and no, and no. She looked at Dicey and spoke grimly. Not for Liza. But if we're supposed to let go, Dicey said, because it was what she had been thinking to herself. I'm willing to let go, Graham declared, because I have to but I am not going to lose my grip on, on what's right. This doesn't make sense, Dicey pointed out. I don't care. Haven't you got any ideas, girl? But of course Dicey did. She had an idea of a box made from many different kinds of wood. She had an idea of the warm brown tones, of the careful workmanship, of the patient sanding smooth. She had an idea of something made by those slow hands, those hands marked by the work they did, but she had no idea of what such a box would cost. I was in a store yesterday, she said to Graham. She was going to say more, but Graham cut her off. Good, I'll have to explain the delay. We should hurry, I expect. 
The wood store wasn't empty when they got there, so they waited for the man to slowly serve his other customers. One of the people was buying goblets. Another was trying to decide about the big train in the window. Daisy was glad the store was busy. <clears throat> While they waited, she showed Graham the boxes she'd been thinking about. You're right, Graham said. I'm glad you were with me. I'm so defeated. I just might have taken one of those horrible things. Daisy stared at Graham. Defeated? Well, she guessed she could understand that. The man recognized Daisy and greeted Graham as if he recognized her too. We are looking for a small box, Graham said. The eyes slowly moved between them and then up to the shelf, Graham indicated. I'm sorry to hear that, the man said. Graham's eyes snapped at him. Your granddaughter was in yesterday, he said. Let me show you. He brought down three boxes, each about the size of a loaf of bread. They chose one where the back of the band of black walnut ran like a ribbon, as if it were tying down the top of the box. How much do we owe you, Graham asked. Nothing, he said. Young man, Graham snapped. We are not asking for charity. It's okay, Graham, Dicey said. At the same time, the bearded man put his hands around the box they had chosen. The cuts on his hands were like the grains of the different woods. Yesterday I thought to give her something, he said to Graham. I don't know why. Yes, I do know why, but I couldn't put words to it. But not out of pity. I would like to give you this, give this box to you. I'm honored, you see. You do see that, don't you? But I don't know if you would take it as a gift. Graham stared at the hands around the box, then she said, yes, I'll take it, in a low voice. I'll take the gift and I'll thank you for it, she said more briskly. Dicey could almost hear the creaking of Graham's fingers as she let go of her pride. Good, the man said. They delivered the box to the undertaker, who told them to return at five. They each had a late lunch. Then they had a late lunch and returned to the motel room to pack. They talked about ordinary things, about taking a train to Wilmington and a bus from there to Salisbury. Daisy changed into her brown dress and belted it at the waist. She and Graham weren't exactly going to make a march, but she wanted to mark the formality of the occasion, taking Mama home. They talked about the presents Daisy had bought, of which Graham approved. Then Graham said, wasn't there change? Daisy had more than $40 left in her coat pocket, and she gave that to Graham. Graham opened her purse to put the money in her wallet. <clears throat> she looked across to Daisy sitting on the other bed. Graham's face looked frightened. Daisy caught part of the feeling. How are we going to pay him? Graham asked. Her voice was whispery. Pay who? The undertaker. Graham's hands fiddled around with the money in her wallet. Then her fingers explored her purse. I never thought about that expense. I thought about travel and room and meals and even the Christmas shopping, but not about the cost of an undertaker. How could I have been so stupid? We can return what I bought, Dicey suggested. We could, except the gloves, and I've got four dollars of my own money left. Graham rustled desperately through her purse. Then she pulled out the envelope Mr. Lingerly had given her, looking at it as if she had forgotten what it was. She opened it and pulled out Chris money and fifty-dollar bills. Five hundred dollars, she said softly. Five hundred. He must have gone to the bank. He must have guessed. I ask you, Dicey, isn't that something for him to do? How did he know? Dicey wasn't thinking about anything except that the color was coming back into Graham's cheeks. Did I look all that discombobulated when I left home, Graham demanded? No, Dicey said. You looked like you knew exactly what you were doing. I thought you did, she complained. Well, you were wrong, Graham snapped. But it's all right now. Remind me to thank him. Dicey snorted. Graham wouldn't need any reminding. We better call them, don't you think, Graham told Dicey, to tell them, and when we'll be back? Will they be home from school? I believe in getting things over with, Graham said. So they called the house in Crisfield. Graham placed the call, placed it collect. She spoke to Mr. Lingerly first, brushing aside his sympathy, but making a point to tell him without his money they would have been in a real difficulty. She told him that they were taking a train that got into Wilmington at eight in the morning and that they would take buses down from there. Graham expected to see everybody at home after school, she said. As far as Dicey could tell, Mr. Lingerly was saying, yes, ma'am, and yes, ma'am, on the other end of the phone. Then Graham handed the phone to Dicey. She told James first. Mama died, she said. I figured that out, he told her. His voice sounded thin. It's better this way, Dicey, he said in that same thin voice. I read about it at the library. Almost nobody recovers when they're as far gone as Mama was. You didn't tell me that, Dicey said, and I don't think it's better no matter what you say. And it isn't as if... She really died last summer, James told her. That's not true, Dicey snapped, although she understood what he meant. The worst of the letting go had been the hope that they'd had last summer. Yes, it is, James answered. Dicey stopped arguing with him. She heard Sammy wrestle the phone from James with an angry demand. It's not true, is it, Dicey? 
It's true, Sammy, she told him. It's really true. She didn't want to. How do you know? I don't know. How could I know, Dicey admitted. But I feel it. She didn't mind. She never opened her eyes. But, Dicey, I wanted her to get better, Sammy said. I know, Dicey told him. It'll be all right, Sammy. It will. We'll all be all right. Adopted means somebody wants you to be her family. But I wanted Mama to be all right, too, Sammy wailed. So did I, Dicey said, but she wasn't. She thought for a minute, trying to see Sammy holding onto the phone in the living room, trying to see his face and into his brain. You know what I'd do if I were at home, she asked. What? I'd go out to the barn and sand down on the boat. Is it warm enough to work in the barn? That wouldn't make anything better, but it would make me feel better. I have to deliver papers. After the papers. Try it, Sammy, if you want to. Let me talk to Maybeth. Dicey, Maybeth's voice asked. We're going to be home tomorrow, Dicey told her sister. We're all right, Maybeth said. Are you all right? Is Graham? Everybody's all right, Dicey said, except Mama. I know, Maybeth said, her voice sad and musical. I know. She didn't say anything more, so Dicey hung up. I hate the telephone, Dicey announced to Graham. You need to have one, Graham told her, with children in the house. We'd better get going. We have to check out and go over to the undertaker's. Have you kept the box out? They had to wait in a room so thick with the smell of flowers, so thick with slow, heavy music, so thick with a soft carpet that soaked in any noises, that Dicey felt as if she was swimming in underwater for too long. When the man came out to give back their box, Dicey reached out for it and held it close against her chest. Graham paid the man silently. They took a cab to the train station, bought tickets, and sat waiting on hard wooden benches. They boarded the train as soon as it pulled into the station. Dicey lifted the suitcase up into a rack overhead. She sat down by the window and held the box on her lap. After a while, the train started on its way. It was snowing when they left Boston and the big flakes that surrounded the sky. The train rattled along. Graham got them some supper and brought it back to the seats in a cardboard tray. The sandwiches were wrapped in thin plastic and still they were dried out. But the sodas were all right. When they had finished, Graham looked out the window. I can't see a blessed thing, she said. I'm going to sleep. She spread her coat out over her legs like a blanket. She leaned her head back and closed her eyes, but she continued talking. It's funny if you think about it. This is the only time I've traveled out of Maryland, and I can't see a thing. Graham, Dicey said, her voice so loud Graham's eyes popped open. But you knew how to do everything. I knew how to do nothing, Graham told her. I just did everything. There's a difference. You should know that. Cripes, Dicey said, remembering how she had followed her grandmother around, not having to worry about anything. That's brave. Graham closed her eyes again, and her sudden smile flashed across her tired face. She hadn't slept at all last night, Dicey guessed. Tillermans have that kind of courage, she told Dicey. We have brave spirits. It's brave hearts we don't have. Think about it, girl. Except your mama. She had a brave heart for trusting people or loving them for all the good it did her. I wish I knew. Then Graham's eyes flashed open again, and her face looked entirely awake. I have some hope for you, too. You and all of you. But why they use heart for hearts for love, I don't know. It's where you feel things, Dicey said, remembering feeling. But not Valentine hearts. Graham agreed and closed her eyes again. Those bright red hearts, perfectly symmetrical, and those overweight cupids they put with them for Valentines, babies with rolls of fat on their legs and chipmunk cheeks. I could never like a fat baby. My babies were skinny and hairy. When she was born, your mama had a head of curly black hair like a cocker spaniel. Can you imagine your mama like that? Of course, it all fell out, fell out within the week, but can you imagine? Dicey almost answered this, but saw that Graham was asleep. Graham made frequent... The train, the train made frequent stops. And Dicey watched to see the names of the places. She knew she should put her head back, close her eyes, and try to sleep. She knew she couldn't see anything much out the window, between the heavy snow and the speed of the train. But she shifted the box against her arm and peered out. Her seat swayed and jounced as the train rattled over the tracks. After every stop, the conductor came by. He looked at the two ticket stubs tucked into a hook above Graham's head. He glanced at Graham and then at Dicey. After two stops, he finally asked her, What is in that? What is that box for? Dicey couldn't think of what to tell him. He began a kind of game, guessing what might be in it. Love letters from her boyfriend, he guessed, and a stamp collection, a pet mouse, her jewelry, something to eat, seashells, buttons. Dicey got so she was half waiting for him, and she was ready to shake her head at him now. The snow lightened as they traveled south. 
Once, looking out the windows on the other side of the car, Dicey thought she saw water. She was sure she saw a black field that glimmered like winter, and, like water and stretched out like water. Dicey realized that the train was going the same way the children had last summer. For some reason, this disturbed her. She climbed out of her seat, holding the box carefully. It wouldn't pop open. She knew how tightly the lid fitted down. But still, she carried it gently. She found a bathroom at the end of the car and let herself in the door. The bathroom was smaller than a closet, and somehow it seemed to lurch more than her seat did. She went to the bathroom, flushed, and ran some water in the sink to splash over her face. She caught a glimpse of her face in the mirror, pale above the dark brown of the dress. Her eyes looked wary. She wondered why. Once the box, which she had set on a counter just about big enough to hold a purse, started to slide off. Dicey caught it in her damp hands. Instead of going back to her seat, Dicey went two cars ahead to find the snack bar. There she spent a long time looking at the menu. Finally, decided she decided on another soda and a package of potato chips. To reach her money in the pocket of her dress, Dicey had to rest the box on the countertop. The man working there stared at it. That's a pretty thing, he said. What's it for? School stuff? School stuff, Dicey asked. Pencils, erasers, paper clips? Oh, she said. Oh, no. She took up the little cardboard tray that held her purchases and fled. Dicey stumbled past people sleeping in their seats. Because both of her hands were holding something, she couldn't grab at seat backs to keep her balance. She had never realized that trains were this hard to walk in. Back in her own car, she sat down in empty seats across from Graham. Her grandmother was sleeping soundly, even though her head rolled with the swaying of the train. Dicey opened the can of soda to pour half a glass. More than that might spill. She tore the top off the potato chips. She settled the box in her lap. She felt like she was running away again, the way they had run away from Bridgeport, or even before that, when Bridgeport was the place they were running to. To be awake in the deep dark of night, that might be what was causing the feeling. Then she could see, as if she held a map in her hands, the places the four of them had traveled over. The snow outside had faded away. Dicey watched out the window. The train rattled over the Connecticut River, where they had taken a boat to row. She didn't know how she knew so surely that the broad black belt was that river, but she knew. She could remember how it felt to row across the black water and not know what waited on the opposite bank. Twenty minutes later, the train pulled into the big railroad station at New Haven. Dacey peered out the dirty window, but she was looking at the pictures her memory made. The train pulled out of the station and back into the darkness. The pictures her memory made had songs in them, clearer than the noise of the train. All the songs seemed to be blending together into music as complicated as some of Maybeth's piano pieces. But Dicey could pick them out, each one, each separate melody. The people they had been last summer, the person she had been, Dicey guessed she'd never be afraid again, not the way she had been all summer. She had taken care of them all, sometimes well, sometimes badly, and they'd covered the distances. For most of the summer, they had been unattached. Nobody knew who they were or what they were doing. It didn't matter what they did, as long as they all stayed together. Dicey remembered that feeling of having things pretty much her own way. And she remembered the feelings of danger. It was a little bit like being a wild animal, she thought to herself. Dicey missed that wildness. She knew she would never have it again. And she missed some and she missed the sense of Dicey Tillerman against the whole world and doing all right. But had anything really changed? Dicey looked across to her sleeping grandmother, and she thought about her job and school, about James, Maybeth, and Sammy, about Mina and Jeff. She thought about the little boat she was preparing for next spring. She thought about Graham's house, their house, about the fields folded around it and the bay beyond. Whatever was outside the window flashed past so fast she couldn't really see it. She thought to herself she had to let go of what she, what had gone before too, didn't she? The people of last summer and who she had been. Dicey felt as if she was standing in the wind, holding up her own hands. She felt as if colored ribbons blew out of her hands and danced away on the wind. She felt as if, even if she wanted to, she couldn't close her fingers around those ribbons. Daisy knew that she was sitting very still on a train, moving across the night. She knew her hands were wrapped around the wooden box that held the ashes of her mama, but she felt as if a wind blew through her hands and took even mama away. What did that leave her with? The wind and her empty hands. The wind and Daisy. All right, I don't have a lot left, guys, but I think it might be too long to record, so I'm going to pause here, end this video, and record the last little bit and post that right after this. So... You will be getting the conclusion of the book today. Thanks for watching, guys. Have an awesome day, and I'll be back soon with more stuff.